What's the difference between simple moving average and exponential moving average? Well, it's a mathematical formula that su supposedly makes the 20 period moving average basically front loaded. So think about this, Karen. The 20 period simple moving average is simply taking 20 data points from each bar. So if, you, if it's a daily chart, you're taking, let's say, the close of, of the last 20 bars, you're adding all of those values up, you're dividing by 20, and you get an evenly balanced 20 period moving average. So the 20 period simple moving average is balanced throughout the entire 20 bar data set. Now listen to me carefully. The exponential moving average is a mathematical formula that front loads the 20 period moving average. And so instead of the data points being considered equal, it places a heavier weighting on, let's say, the last five. And so the, the, the front end of that 20 period moving average moves faster than the tail end. So in the, the, the simple moving average, all data points along the 20 period moving average are considered equal, right? They're equal throughout the whole 20. Every data point is equal. But when you place more importance on the last five, the front part, is that the front part of yours? No, I think this is the front part. The fr <laughs> you looked at your way. The front part of the moving average reacts faster than the tail part. And so if the, if, if the, if the stock has been shooting up over the past three days, that 20 period moving average will flip up faster than the exponential will flip up faster than the regular 20 will flip up. So some people consider that better. There's, there are things like the weighted moving average, which weights the middle, all right? So the weighted moving average plate says there's the, there's the beginning of the 20 period data set, there's the end of the, of the 20 period data set, and then there's the middle. So typically a weighted moving average will not place the emphasis on the, on the, on the, the first part of the 20 or the, the last part, it'll put it in the middle and give it almost like this seesaw weighted or balance type of mix. Listen, let me just tell you this. I have experimented with every possible form of moving average you can think of. I've even created versions of my own moving averages, and guess what? I went all the way to the stars and back. I'm back, it's freaking simple. I keep it simple. If I have a choice of overcomplicating something or adding something sexier to it, I will opt for the basic. I will opt for the simple. And to be honest with you, when you look at a simple moving average and you overlay an exponential, the difference is so small that it really doesn't matter in, in, in the grand scheme of things anyway, because I'm always telling you that moving averages, while they appear to be skinny lines on your chart, they are far from being skinny lines. They're more like zones or boxing ropes. You know how the rope the ropes of a boxing ring look small, but you can lean on them. They have leeway, right? So the same way your skinny line looks skinny, but it has leeway. So when you, get, when you break the 20 by a little bit, you're really not breaking it. You're leaning against the ropes, right? But the ropes don't break. And a lot of people get this mi mixed up. They treat moving averages as if they're glass floors or ceilings and they break or shatter at the first point of contact. And that's not true. They are zones. Do you understand? They're ropes you can lean on. And I wish there were a way for charts to make moving averages rubbery, like a rubber band, but they can't. When should we increase size on a play? When the risk is low or when the probability is high? This is a good question. The person goes on to say, I have seen you play heavy size when you see low risk. Can you talk more on this? Yes. The question is, can size be determined by the amount of risk or the risk unit that you're taking in a trade? And the answer is yes. My size is not entirely determined by risk, but it is partially so. So let me give you an example of this. Let's say I have a maximum loss per trade of $100. Listen to me carefully, traders. Built into my trading plan is this rule. I will not lose more than $100 on any given trade. That is part of my trading rule, right? As an example, this play I'm about to take has a risk of 
40 cents. So the stop, if I take this trade, the stop is 40 cents away. So if I take 100 shares of that play, I'll lose $40. But if I take 200 shares of that play, I'll lose $80, which still stays within my maximum $100 loss per trade. I'll do 200 shares versus one. You see what I'm saying? So that helps me determine what size am I going to play here? Can I get away with more without losing more? So I'm going to lose the same 100 or less, but with 200 shares, I have a greater upside potential than with 100 shares, but with the same risk. So I do use risk to determine size. Another example, just to drill that point home, I have a $100 maximum loss per trade. My risk now is 25 cents. Let's say it's 23 cents, just a little bit below 25 cents, because that's where the stop is. Now, we don't determine what the risk is. The trade actually does. So on this particular trade, I'm buying above a small bar, right below that small bar. It's 23 cents away. I can do four lots on this play and not increase my risk of $100 or less. And so one trade that might have a, an 80 cent stop, I can only do 100 shares. The trade that has 40 cents, I can do 200 shares. The trade that has a 23 cent stop, I can do 400 shares. So my risk is the same on all of those op- those trades, but the upside potential is greater with the greater size. So yes, I use risk, my risk unit to determine, my risk unit and my maximum loss per trade to determine how big or small the trade's going to be. But that's not the only thing that I consider as well for size. I consider upside potential. And I consider not only upside potential, but time duration of the trade. So if my time duration of the trade is going to be very short, my size goes up. Let me give you an example. If I'm going to hold a stock for five years, I'm going to play it smaller. If I'm going to hold the stock for five minutes, I can play it much bigger because what's the odds of something bad happening in five years versus five minutes? The odds are exponentially higher over five years that the unexpected in a bad way happens to me. So I have to lower my size with a five-year play. But five minutes gives me a short enough period of time to believe that a meteor is not going to hit planet Earth, in which case the trade doesn't matter anyway. All right? No additional war is going to break out. In this five minutes, the Federal Reserve is not going to hike interest rates by surprise. Time duration, the smaller my t- the time duration of my trade, the safer the trade. The longer, the actually, the riskier the trade to a, to a certain extent. All right? This is not universal, but to a certain extent. I want my traders thinking this way. So to take it from a to take that concept to a pure trading perspective if i'm going to if i'm going to play this play for two or three bars so i'm buying right now and i think the stock can shoot up two or three bars after this buy buy boom boom out okay that's a short term scout play buy one bar two bar out all right or short one bar two bar out okay that's a scout that play I can play bigger than if I'm going for a play over an hour or so, 50 minutes to an hour. So now because my money is exposed to the possibility of danger longer, all right, I have to, but my gain, my potential gain is bigger. I can afford to shrink the size. The shrinking of the size doesn't mean I make less. I could make more because my time horizon is longer, but because more can go wrong, I'm also going to shrink my size. So time duration, also, um, so time duration of the trade, risk of the trade, the potential of the trade as well. The potential is very short. My size goes up. If the potential is bigger, my size goes down. Um, In which cases are can we use a stop and reverse versus just a stop? This is a very, very good question. So um, let me reiterate the question once again. 
there are stops where you get into a play, the play does not do what you expected it to do. You have a risk limit, right? Call the stop where you're gonna just the line in the sand where you're gonna end the trade, boom, stop, and you move on. That's a stop and move on, right? A stop and move on to a different play. Boom, I'm out and I move on. That's one type of stop. The other type of stop is a stop and then reverse the same play. So I'm long this play. I'm betting on this play being on the upside. It fails to do what I want it to do on the upside. It eliminates me. It stops me out. But I also now take that same play in the opposite direction. When So the question is, when is it appropriate to do just a stop and leave, a stop and move on, versus a stop and reverse? And while I can't go into the specifics in great detail here, this is not the format, my traders know this explicitly. The key is violence. That's right, violence is the key to knowing the difference between when you stop and move on and when you stop and then go the other way and reverse on the same play. And let me give you a general idea of what I mean by violence. Every stop out is not equal, traders. You all know this. If you have any experience in trading, you know that some stop outs sort of grudgingly and gradually and very mildly reach your limit and you stop out. It's almost like water torture to get stopped out. That's one type of stop out. Others stop out where, you know, they waffle around. Maybe they give you a little bit of in, a little bit of hope that they're going to they're going to work. They start moving in your favor a little bit, then they stop moving in your favor and sort of drift back toward your stop and stop you out. Then th those stop outs are not the stop and reverse. They are the, all right, end the play and move on to something else. But when you enter something that you expect to go up as an example, and almost, almost as soon as the door shut, you get in, Okay, guys, um, we've got them inside. Shut the doors, put the locks on, and boom! Then they slam you right away. You get slammed right away almost as soon as you get in and say, okay, I'm in the play. The door shut, and boom! Stop out like that. That's the stop in reverse. That's the violent elimination. That's the violent stop. That's the trap stop. They trapped you inside as soon as you got in. There was no hope provided. There was no light given to you. There was nothing good that happened almost as soon as the door shut. As soon as the door shut, boom, they slammed you. When you get slammed or stopped out like that, it is worth flipping it and seeing if the opposite direction is, can make up not only for your loss, but bring you into profitable territory. And the reason why this tends to work more often than not is the concept of velocity. I call it violence, but it's also the concept of velocity. Velocity or violence has better than an 80% chance of following through. And it just goes to physics, guys. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, Newton basically taught us that an object fiercely in motion will tend right, to continue in that motion, in that direction. This velocity, this igniting violence, this igniting velocity has a huge, huge probability of continuing in that direction. So when you get stopped out gradually, that's not being eliminated with velocity. That's not being eliminated with violence. That's a dud, move on. But the velocity break, stop out, the violent stop out. That's the one that has odds of continuing in that stopped out direction for a while. When there are considerable tails, uh, we can remove them, yes, but isn't the tail a sign of reversal? Yes, it is. So let me see if I can demonstrate this for you. Take a look at these tails here. But now look at the bodies. Look at the body. Those tails are not as significant as the bodies in this case because they don't demonstrate or show you where the vast majority of the trading activity took place. 
They're anomalies in this respect. It is appropriate in this case to remove the tails. And let's get down to where the vast majority of the trading took place. Now, let's put a freaking trend line right across that major peak up there last cycle. And so this would tell you that this is major support area. If Bitcoin were to drop into this area, it would likely hold. This is what I call, my traders know this as minor support. What's minor support? Minor support is when you have a prior peak that gets broken through and that it was the ceiling, and now the ceiling is the floor, all right? That's what that is. And so, in the same way that I erased the tails at the top here, I would erase this one too, at the bottom. Because I'm only, I'm not concerned with the exception, I'm concerned with I'm more concerned with where did the majority of the activity take place? Let me do that again. You see? And that's a cleaner scenario. And it's not to say that tails don't have any importance. It's just that when it comes to finding support and resistance, the tails are not as relevant it's the so solid part of the bar that's more relevant for finding support and resistance all right the tails have very little support and resistance qualities or they have less support and resistance qualities as the bodies do oliver uh can you explain how two or more time frame charts can conflict and how to approach it what I teach my traders is that you should always obey your trading time frame. Always obey your trading time frame. If your trading time frame is saying yes and your another time frame is saying no, obey the trading time frame. Do not let another time frame stop you from obeying your trading time frame. The problem some of you have is that everything's your trading time frame, and that's wrong. You've got to pick a trading time frame. You've got to pick a boss. The boss has advisors. The other time frames can advise, but they can't tell the boss. The boss is your trading time frame. And you must always obey the trading time frame. Now, how do you reconcile your trading time frame saying go and another time frame saying I wouldn't quite do that? How do you reconcile that? Size. So if the quintessential trade is two lots in, if you have a conflict, drop to one lot. Don't not do what your trading time frame says do. So use the conflict to adjust size, not to say nay or yay. Best time frame for Forex. I actually prefer the bigger time frames on Forex. So I love the four hour time frame. I like the hourly time frame as well. But I really love the four hour time frame because with currencies, when they trend, they trend powerfully and they tend to trend for a long time. And that longer time frame gives you the ability to ride a trend in Forex for multiple, multiple days. Now, in equities, my traders and I are not allowed to hold a position overnight in our active trading accounts, but in Forex, we can. And so that four hour time frame is my trade for a multiple day play time frame. And if it's going to be a shorter time frame, you know, I like the hourly as well. But I like the bigger time frames for Forex than I do with equities. Three primary trends are uptrend, downtrend, sideways trend. And you have to be able to be good at capturing the origin of a trend. So let me just show you this again very quickly. So here's a sideways movement. That's a trend. But this one, that 
has initiated a break of the sideways trend. But it is not until that one, two, three that you can legitimately say you are now in a downtrend. You have now started a downtrend and it, you're certain now. It's after one, two, three. Now you're in a downtrend. This is a transitional phase. So the market has these transitional phases, right? And let me, let me, let me draw, let me draw all of them out for you. That's all the market can do over and over and over again. There is nothing else that the market can ever deliver to you. It delivers you this, the bell-shaped curve um, uh, right side up, and it delivers the bell-shaped curve upside down. But it can only do these things, this one movement. Now, this one movement is broken up into different segments. So one, two, three, four, and it repeats one again. All right. Now, one is the uptrend. I mean, two is the uptrend. Four is your downtrend. All right. Ones and threes are your tops and bottoms, oftentimes sideways. So you can look at just like that. All right. It's just repeated over and over and over again. Now, when you know that this is the cycle that repeats itself over and over again, and you know how to break that cycle up into its appropriate parts, which is uptrend sideways, downtrend sideways, right? The master level is to be able to identify the transitional periods in between the three trends. So one transitional period is what I, what I taught you, right? Which is sideways. How do you break out of that? One, two, three. This is the transitional period. You understand? And this transitional period is usually rocky and it knocks a lot of traders off. That's the goal of the transition. This is no longer the transition. That's the uptrend. This is not a transition. That's the sideways. But there is something that links the sideways to the uptrend. This linkage is wild and whippy and knocks a, and knocks a lot of traders off the move. And we can see it here in Bitcoin where look at the wild and whippy. So here's the break one here's the slam back down boom and here is i didn't pull it back enough and there is after people got long boom they slam them to get the market slams them to try to shake them off and then leaves them behind this is your transitional period in this cycle right right there boom and the highest level of market play are is derived from the traders that know how to play all parts of the cycle masterfully all right and there's seven parts which I've just outlined for you, right? There's seven parts to this cycle. Here's one, here's one, here's one. That's three. Well, that's not, that's really repeating this one again. Here's another, here's another. So there's one, two, three, four before you repeat. And then there's three others. The three others are what links these together. These are the parts. If you can master all the trends and master the transitional periods, you've got everything in the market covered. There is nothing that the market can do that you do not know how to handle. All right, it's not really rocket science, but very few traders and market participants understand this. 
Very few understand the different parts. The market is just like a, it's, it's a, it's a very simple puzzle. It's only got seven or eight pieces to the puzzle. And you've got to know each one of those seven to eight things intimately, know how to play them, know how to handle yourself in each one of the seven to eight scenarios. And then it's just a repetitive game after that. Then it's just repeat, 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 repeat. The market doesn't have a lot of things to throw at you. It's got seven or eight things it just throws at you over and over and over again. And it, in the beginning, it feels like it's a lot of things, but it's really just versions of these seven to eight things over and over again. And being those who have mastered the game have just mastered being able to identify which of the seven to eight things it is right now and how to take care of how to handle myself in that scenario and how to protect myself under the circum under those those occasional circumstances where it doesn't happen according to the way it should happen and that's all trading is guys that's all it is